I'm serious about that. Good. Hello, welcome to the THC Show. I'm your host, Neil Magnuson. This is the show where we talk about uh, THC. You know, truth, hope, and change. Uh, things that we need a lot in our world. And how they relate to uh, actual THC. On the show today, we're going to have 8 out of 10 Glenn uh, join us for the uh, 420 session, as always. And we'll take, make a visit out to the new Weedabago, the uh, CSP uh, Healing Wave uh, Ganja RV. Uh, and uh, nothing to report by way of uh, like fire bombing or anything like that this week, so that's good. Uh, and we'll just uh, cover a few of the things that have been going on and do a little bit of update on these things. And uh, that's how we're going to do the show today. Um, we are on the cusp of court. Uh, one week from today, uh, we will be in court. Um, Funny, my lawyer messaged me today and said that I, I don't necessarily need to be there if I don't want to be, that uh, he's going to argue our case, uh, you know, uh, against the Crown, who are going to try to explain to a judge why they think it's in the public's interest to uh, continue to spend money prosecuting us to try to harm us and punish us for uh, all the sins that we've committed here with the CSP and the Healing Wave. Um, I, I'm absolutely appalled as I have been since the, the beginning of this whole thing. It, it doesn't get better, it just keeps getting worse. Uh, I don't think that uh, the Crown is going to give it up easy, uh, having spent all this money and all this time. The amount of disclosure that was involved in, uh, in this case uh, indicates that they have, uh, oh, for over a year, been spending an enormous amount of taxpayer dollars uh, on investigating it, an investigation that the VPD termed Investigation Blaze, uh, Project Blaze, uh, which is uh, very ironic or maybe it's telling, I'm not sure which, but um, you know, at the, uh, as for the last couple of weeks, what we've been telling you about is the firebombing of our RV, which uh, certainly went up in a blaze. And uh, we're now three weeks in from that event happening, and we really don't have uh, any further uh, knowledge than we had originally as to what caused this. Uh, we did get uh, the person breaking in the night before who on his exit announced that he was going to firebomb the RV. But uh, we've never uh, gotten any reports as to it being any particular group. Uh, no one has come and uh, suggested that maybe we should have taken that, uh, that message that was sent. Um, so uh, it becomes curiouser and curiouser as to, uh, you know, the actual source of that event. Maybe it was just a random uh, meth-crazed fire bug that uh, had an issue with us for some reason that he thought had happened. I can't really imagine that. We look after everybody here. We've got really, really high-quality products at really, really low prices. And if anybody's not happy with something that they get, it's uh, quickly replaced. We have the best uh, customer relations policies uh, that there are because that's what I believe in here. So I'm not sure why someone would be unhappy with our uh, service or our products and decide that it was worth such an extreme violent act. That doesn't make much sense to me. Although I live in a neighborhood and we operate in a neighborhood where a lot of things don't make a lot of sense, there are a lot of very crazy people here who are easily triggered and uh, do act out in uh, very extreme ways. So, I mean, it doesn't mean that's not what happened. It means that uh, it doesn't sound right to me yet. I really don't know. But, um, you know, as those people in the neighborhood uh, asked around, um, if it had been uh, someone uh, locally that uh, was not wanting to compete with our $1 Rams or our $10 Shatter or you know, the other uh, really low barrier prices that we have here. Uh, maybe you, uh, it could have been somebody that was involved with uh, selling people hard drugs that we're actively uh, and openly trying to get people off of. Uh, we don't know, but because none of the people in the neighborhood that, that we're associated with who care about us, who've been out there with their ear to the ground trying to figure all this out, haven't come back with anything. And like I say, there's been no one that said, uh, you know, sent a little extra nudge to say, hey, we gave you a warning and you're still here. What, what's going on? Um, it starts to make me feel like maybe there's something more corporate uh, involved. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's not even a hunch. It's just, uh, it's just what happens when other possibilities become eliminated, that uh, there becomes a uh, few other options that uh, would make sense. 
I don't know that it makes sense for the corporate world or the government world to uh, going to the extreme of uh, firebombing an RV. I don't know. And then that's the thing. And I guess that's what I'm here to report at this time is that uh, here we are three weeks later and we just don't know. Um, we haven't uh, changed much, uh, if, if anything. I mean, we certainly do have some uh, added safety protocols. We were a couple of weeks underneath the tent, but uh, for over a week now we've been in our new home, our new RV. We're very happy about that. Uh, it's a Ford as opposed to a Chevy. We'll see which one wins this race. I uh, got a little more headroom, got some uh, shag carpeting on the walls. After all, it's 43 years old. But uh, that's great for this time of year when it's really cold outside. It does have a lot better insulation than the other one had, a little more headroom. So uh, we're happy to have the RV back. Uh, I have not been leaving it uh, parked where we park it uh, like I did the other one. Uh, I've been moving it every night. Uh, I had thought that uh, parking it in front of the police station where I parked my other car at night, it's, it's just a half a block up the road, would be a good idea. Uh, difficult to do, there's not much parking around the police station, most of it is for police vehicles, but there is some public parking there. And like I say, for, uh, for a long time, for over two years, I've been parking my vehicle there at night, uh, because for the first six months that we were here on this block, I had my car broken into three times. So on the third time, I finally got smart, and uh, decided I could park my car across from the police station and that would be a lot safer. Um, I also felt that would be the case for the RV. And so uh, on a Sunday evening, uh, there was uh, not many cars parked up there in the, in the little bit of public parking that there is, and I managed to get the RV parked up there and, uh, and that was great. It worked out a lot better. I didn't have to take a taxi to go and get it and, and all the rest that I have to do in the mornings when I park it in my, at my friend's place. But... Uh, I then on another night, uh, I guess it was the Friday or Thursday night, last week, this past week, um, there was there was space there, and I put the RV there. And uh, Friday morning, uh, walking up to the RV, I could see that the back uh, door had been uh, uh, jimmied, the back window had been smashed, the uh, curtain was hanging out the back of it. Uh, upon opening the door or looking in there, actually they never did get the door unlocked. They didn't get the, the lock to, to unlock. They crawled in through the window, whoever he was or whatever they were, or whoever, I don't know. Um, you see, the thing of it is there's cameras there and that, that's what I thought foolishly was that uh, first I thought, well, nobody's going to break in here. It's the police station right across the street in the courthouse that, that we're parked in front of and there's cameras all over the place, but those cameras actually don't pick up the back of the RV, the way it was parked there, and so that if somebody got to the, the RV uh, with a hood and a mask perhaps, then we wouldn't be able to recognize them anyway. But none of that matters, because the truth is, is that, it, you know, the second thing I thought about the safety of it was that there's cameras there, and if, and if somebody broke in, then, uh, you know, we'd be able to see who it was, right? And, and that would maybe solve something, right? But no, it didn't solve anything, because uh, for one thing, you can't get through on the non-emergency line. I, I talked to a couple of the officers right there and, and they told me this is what you have to do. You have to phone the non-emergency number and you have to report it. Well, I phoned that number and got put on hold and a series of uh, recorded uh, messages later and an hour plus later, I realized that this isn't gonna work. This is nonsense. Uh, they kept coming on and saying uh, all other operators are, uh, or all of our operators are answering 911 calls at the moment, so it'll be a while before anybody gets to you. So I gave up on that because some of the other recordings were talking about that, uh, you know, if there was $10,000 in losses or damage, uh, then I could report it online, uh, then they'd probably take it seriously. But uh, my impression of all that was is that because I've got a few hundred dollars damage to the back door of a 43-year-old RV, and even though the inside was torn, turned upside down, every compartment was, was open and had been, had been uh, scrutinized, there was really nothing that was stolen. So I don't have a $10,000 claim. Uh, they're not going to care enough to, to do anything about it. Nobody's going to be looking at those tapes to see who it was. Uh, nobody's going to be sharing that information with me to say, hey, does this look like somebody you recognize or anything like that. Um, I was just foolish to think that parking it up there would make a difference. So now every uh, night I take it uh, over a mile away and uh, put it at a friend's place and then go get it in the morning. 
uh, which uh, you know is okay until it doesn't start, which happened the other morning where it uh, you know, turned the key and it didn't want to go. Um, I found that there was a brand new starter as I got underneath there and gave it a couple of whacks and that didn't help either, but I let, lurched it forward a couple of times and I got it to turn over and I got it to start and it hasn't given me any trouble starting since then. I'm going to have a mechanic look at it. But yeah, the perilous uh, times of the CSP, uh, trying to make all this work um, in, uh, you know, with a whole bunch of obstacles and barriers in front of us. And that, that's the opposite of what needs to be happening here. Uh, you know, I, re I remember well, and I've mentioned it a few times, I think even in last week's show, I mentioned that uh, Professor Zachary Walsh, who is the foremost expert on cannabinoid replacement therapies uh, in Canada, um, had written us a, a beautiful letter of support back when we were filing our application with Health Canada over two years ago. And, uh, and he was very clear in his letter about how, how what we're doing is actually helping to save people's lives. It's rescuing them from addiction. That there should be no obstacles or barriers put in our way. That we should be encouraged and allowed to expand and, and, and continue our work with. And, and you know, that keeps coming back to me that he wrote that because all we've got uh, in, with, the, uh, with our interactions with governments is nothing but obstacles, barriers, and delays. Um, this uh, program of ours that was started, uh, well, it'll be six years this February that we actually started out giving uh, care packs away to people um, and demonstrating how effective that could be. I mean, that, that's what this was, was a demonstration. And uh, I tried to, to make it an actual project that would be supported by government. That was the real plan. I, I mean, I didn't want to have to do demonstrations every day. What I wanted to do was be able to properly address government and explain to them clearly that the science shows that cannabis, especially in the form of high-dose edibles and concentrates, can be very effective in replacing the use of opioids and mitigating the problems associated with that, but most importantly, in helping people get through withdrawal and getting off those drugs completely. So what I hoped was is that the City Council, mostly, would pay attention to what I had to say, would, would take a look at the studies that were backing up what I was saying, and that they would support us in what we were doing. But uh, that didn't happen uh, at all. Um, I presented to City Council, I held up a clear plastic bag with a half a dozen high-dose edibles, and I told them that that was the real safe supply. That when they're talking about a safe supply for people that are involved with these drugs, well, there was nothing safer than, than a bag of cannabis edibles. And, and that for all these good reasons, we needed to make sure that they were as easily available as possible to people, and that was the gist of what I was trying to do. Uh, I had the, the backing of Van Du. I've been associated with Van Du for a long time, for almost 20 years prior to this. Uh, I've been involved with Van Du on, on in numerous levels, uh, doing numerous things with them, helping them with different actions, uh, supporting them in what they were doing. But also, uh, they approached me back in 2009 and asked me to uh, take lead with a green project of providing cannabis to the people that were using hard drugs uh, as a harm reduction option. And uh, that lasted only a couple of weeks before the lawyers for Coastal Health and for Van Du uh, realized that that's what they were trying to do and uh, threatened to pull the funding if they continued to do that, which is uh, atrocious because, uh, you know, that was a, a solid answer. But I had Van Du with me and, and, as, and me with them. Uh, we are Van Du. That is what we are. That is what I, I said when I presented to the VPD board next that um, you know we are Van Du, this is what we do at Van Du, is we solve the life-threatening problems that arise in this neighborhood and we do it despite bad laws that would say that we can't do that. That's what they did with the InSight, the supervised injection site, and uh, that's what we did with the CSP. Uh, despite uh, not getting approval from government, despite the Cannabis Act and not allowing for uh, what we were actually going to do in the giving out of these things, we went ahead and did it because that was the right thing to do. We are not supposed to stand by and watch people die when we know that we have the solution right in our hands and not do it simply because uh, either a corrupt or an ignorant government doesn't get it and won't allow you to do that. Um, that's not how Van Du operates, and I stand with them, and they stand with me, as we now find ourselves going before the courts. So, 
It's been almost six years, it will be this February, that we started doing the demonstrations because it was important to, you know, to, to demonstrate that what we were proposing was actually something that worked. And so we did that, and we've been very successful in that. However, uh, over a year ago, the, uh, the VPD decided that it was in the best interests of Canada to uh, uh, support the Cannabis Act and investigate this uh, group of people that were openly selling and providing cannabis as a harm reduction option to see if we were openly selling and providing cannabis as a harm reduction option. Uh, it, it wouldn't have taken much uh, investigative uh, strength to figure that out. Uh, I was very open about it. Uh, we've had signs up all the way. I've, been, I've had conversations with every VPD officer that I could find. In fact, because when we presented to the VPD board, uh, the, the Deputy Chief Steve Rye gave me his personal email. Uh, I also have a relationship with him where he's been informed all the way through uh, with respect to what we're doing here with the CSP and the problems that we've had. But uh, the VPD brass decided that that's what they should do. Uh, they passed that information on to the Federal Crown, and the Federal Crown decided that there was enough evidence there that there were these crimes being committed against the Cannabis Act that they should uh, actually take us to court and see if they can punish us and give me uh, several months in jail and uh, make us stop doing what we're doing. 419, and that's too bad because uh, there's a lot more to this story. Um, you know, what isn't there in all of that huge stack of uh, money that was spent to put together the disclosure that we've been given, what there isn't anywhere in there is any mention of any victim of any sort in any way, shape, or form. And one of the things that it doesn't look like they did as far as their investigation goes was to consult with the people in the neighborhood that had had experience with us to see whether or not those people supported us or whether or not we had hurt them or helped them or what they thought of us. Uh, none of that matters to these uh, these uh, intellectually challenged cowboys. I don't I don't mean to uh, slander cowboys at all, but that's the way these people are acting. Uh, they're not very bright. Uh, they're they're not motivated for what they should be. They think it's okay to spend what looks like hundreds of thousands of Canadian taxpayer dollars on uh, on trying to investigate and successfully penalize me and my team of people that are here responding to a public health emergency at uh, great sacrifice and risk to ourselves and, uh, and yet they think that we should be punished and their only concern is whether or not we were actually providing cannabis for sale to people without a license from the government to do that. And I'll tell you right now in the last few seconds, in fact it's already 420, that we are not the ones on trial for having done that. It's the federal government that's on trial for not having given us that license that should have been forthcoming, that would have protected us from this sort of action against us and would have given us the ability to do this in a mainstream, dignified way uh, as we had demonstrated for years now that this is a successful harm reduction option. In fact, it is the best harm reduction option. So anyway, it's 420. Glenn Wells is here, and all's Wells with Glenn Wells, and uh, he's going to come I'll and get join there, us. Yeah. He's getting there. He's he's got duo duties duties going on. Oh yeah, I wouldn't have to tell him that. We could we could, we could we could we could change your name and give you credit for being the producer under a different name. Oh sure, like a synonym, a synonym, like a porn name, like a porn name or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. Eight out of ten. <laughs> yeah. That's right. And, and anybody who doesn't, who hasn't been watching the show, they might not get that connection. So no. we can say my producer, eight out of ten. We need the ashtray. We do need the ashtray. Yeah. There's, 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 there's a couple of them. Yeah. I got, Thank you. I got that. I got Thank that. You. All right. It is 420 after all. Light them if you got them. Yep. Happy 420, everybody. Happy oh, 420. Yeah. This joint is brought to you by Honey Oil, Weed, and Shatter. Well, I'm well, smoking uh, something else, right? I'm going to smoke oh, what you gave me. smoke what I brought you? Yeah. It's super pink. It's an indica uh, dominant hybrid, uh, 20 to 23% THC. Where'd you get that? Uh, from a friend. Okay. Yep. No, no, uh, no uh, promotion needed? Just No, no, no. Local brawler. Well, yeah, you know, you buy a local at Christmas, right? Yeah. That's, <laughs> the, that's the thing to do. Support your local <laughs> industries. Yep. Speaking of local industries, yeah, we got uh, uh, we got some things uh, coming up here. There's uh, Can of Love, yeah, 
can imagine what would be in a case of love? Probably a Valentine's gift. Because it's going to happen on Valentine's Day at the art gallery. Uh, I think I'm going to be there and support those people. And uh, there's going to be a bunch of tents and stuff. And uh, so today they came and uh, gave us something, Glenn and I. You mean the, uh, the, the fairy weed? Yeah, the, the, uh, the, the weed fairy. The weed fairy shop. Yeah, there you are. Oh, no, this is the, uh, well, I'm sure there's a bunch of fairy anyway. No, there you go. never know. One says Neil, one says uh, Glenn. Yeah, there you go. Thank you, Weed Fairy. Thank you, Weed Fairy Show. Yeah, we were visited by the, visited by the Weed Fairy this so afternoon. So I, I got a little over anxious. I opened the one up, and I was going to start with number one, two, three, four, five, and six. Yeah, but and no. Then, and then I realized, oh, it's no. only a 12th day. So I'm going to get to the 12th day, and then I got nothing before Christmas. <laughs> and I it's, thought, that's not how this is supposed to work. It's supposed to be. Uh, she didn't give this to me on the 6th. No. Because it's five days late. Yeah, that would only bring it to 18. Yeah, so the, we're going to start opening this on like the 12th. The 12th. Yeah. The 12th days of Christmas. Yeah. Yes. That's what we're going to do. Thank you, Weed Fairy. You're thank awesome. You, Weed thank you, Weed Fairy Shop. And thank you, Weed Fairy, for the $50 don donation to Tubes and Dubs. Tubes and Dubs. That's yeah. right. That's, yeah. that's very important. We are now at... Because otherwise you and I are going to be filing for bankruptcy <laughs> shortly down the road there. Oh, yes, I know, I know. <laughs> we're but doing it anyway. We're happy we're, to do yeah, it. Yeah, we're doing it anyway. Uh, we we'll, did hope that a whole bunch of people would help us, and there's still time to do that. We're getting there. We still have two weeks to go. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and what did I say? We're at $405 now, I think. So, are we? Yeah, or something like that, $355 or something. Cool. Yeah, so... So help us out. Yeah. Uh, we're, we've got a thing going on. This is the third year in a row that we've been doing this. So we've been doing giveaways with the CSP since the beginning. But because of our good friend Sterling in, in Saskatchewan there and his efforts to put together some socks and some doobies for people in the wintertime around Christmas, we thought that was a great idea. We reached out to him. He said he was fine with us uh, taking that yep. and running with it. So we've done that. This is our third year now. We've got Tim Hortons on board. We've got Cabela's Socks on board. Yep. We and, got, uh, the, and we got you on board if you want to help us out. Cindy's on board at the Coca Cafe, you said. Right. Yeah. So, and there's um, other people that are fundraising for us a little bit right yeah. now. So with any luck, we need about $2,000. <laughs> That's what uh, yeah, we're, we're in. We're almost there. Yeah. <laughs> we're almost there. We'll get there. And we got two percent. If you're in the Saskatoon area, reach out to Sterling too because he's had to extend his date because it hasn't been very uh, responsive. Sterling got a date? No, no, I meant his date oh. where he's going to give up the socks because he haven't raised enough money yet. So if you're in the Saskatoon area, please help out Sir, Sterling also. You know, Sir, Sterling, our two weeks is a fair bit of time. We've got fairly generous people in our audience, and I, I believe that. Uh, I believe, I believe. I'm an optimist. I believe, yeah. If, if we raise uh, more money than what the, the tubes and dubs then cost, we we're going to yeah. help us. I already helped him out with 500 bucks. Oh, did you? Yeah, I did, yes. And then we're going to help you out helping him out. With <laughs> yeah, I was his first donation. I'm optimistic. I'm, I'm hoping that's going to happen. Uh, you know, you can make that happen. It's a great thing. You know, Christmas time is, is, is at this time of year on purpose. Uh, for generations and generations, uh, people have had to suffer through winters. And, and the winters are really harsh. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and nowadays in the modern oh, yes, era, here, yeah. they're harsh because you have to pay a lot of money for heat. But uh, in the past, hey, Sadie Lou, yeah, nice. in the past there was no heat to pay money for. Uh, keeping warm was a very hard thing to do. There was a lot of hardship that happened as a result of, uh, of going through winters and people that uh, didn't have the necessary things to do that. We have down clothing and fancy blankets and air, you know, heated cars and heated yep. blankets and electric yep. this and all the things that we have, they didn't have for a long, and the, long time. And the week there was saying that she was once down here and having warm socks is very, very important to these people. It is, because you know. your feet are what you have to walk on to, to get the money, then the food that you have to walk and they stand in line and stuff. And so it should warm never be. socks, I know. It should never be that you're lacking in socks. Yes. In the winter time, at Christmas time, it should never be. So that's why we're gonna, you know, start at that very low level and try to get. Go find these in the title. But uh, but the for link. my point is, is that you know this is a tough time of year, and, and oh, historically yeah. for generations, this has been a very tough time of year. You can imagine, uh, you know, since the 1700s here in Canada, the settlers, uh, and and obviously the indigenous people of, of yeah. Canada as well. And what they, it must have been like for them going through the winters. It would have been very, very harsh. Oh. And so we've come up with this, uh, you know, this way to, to help keep each other warm by bringing some warmth into this tough time of year, by, by having the spirit of giving go along John's with gonna all bring, this. John's going to bring Christmas dinner, right? John's, John's going to bring Christmas, Christmas dinner. dinner so uh, Christmas we're going to get a couple of turkeys. Yeah. Uh, we're going to cook way more than we need, and we're going to give away whatever uh, my staff doesn't consume to yeah. the people in the neighborhood. Yeah. Uh, and we've done that every year. As well. <laughs> so, uh, but 
but yeah, get involved in this, you know, don't just, uh, you know, uh, sulk about Christmas or have your own little parties at Christmas. I mean, spread the warmth, yep. spread the love, spread the joy. Uh, that's what it's all really about. And you know, we live in an echo chamber that uh, when you when you spread love and joy and warmth like that, that's what comes back to you. Yep. And uh, that's how you feel good about yourself and all of those things. It's, it's a great way to embrace humanity and to help the human race is to have that spirit of giving yeah. and, and loving it. You're not only, only going to warm their feet, but you're going to warm their hearts too that's with right. your gift, right? Exactly. That, that's it, right? Exactly. And it's going to show them that people actually do care, right? So yeah, there's yeah. a big spiel for you. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I get so <laughs> Look, sloppy. I don't know why I yeah, do that. Either. Yesterday I went and donated blood. because you Did know, you? Yeah. I have too the, much? I have the second rarest blood in the world. Really? Yes. So only 9% of the population has my blood type. I see. Right, so I got like O positive? No, B positive. B positive. B I positive. think it's like everybody should be yeah. positive. Well, that, I, that's what I was saying to the girl yesterday is that that's why the world is so negative because only 9% of the population in the world is B positive. <laughs> <It's> B positive. <laughs> right, so 91%. It might, it might only take, maybe it's 10%. We need one more, more percent right, of yeah, people B positive <laughs> and then we can shift the whole world. Yeah, right? there we go. Maybe right. that's critical mass of positivity. <laughs> We can only hope. But uh, I also found out that my stem cells are, are pretty much well, very wanted. And that if they, wanted. Need, if they need your stem cells, they will fly you to anywhere in the world. Wow. So, so you can save that person's life. Wow. Yeah, being that I have the second rarest blood in the world, my stem cells would be uh, like in demand. Sort of wow. thing. So that's what they mentioned to me yesterday. So that's very cool. Something I'll look into. Yeah. 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 You know, be able to travel a little yeah. <laughs> yeah, just, some stem you cells. Know, yeah. Go from place to place to place, drop it off a few stem cells here and there for, you know, save a life here, save I, a life I there. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, we'll see. That's, that sounds weird. <laughs> but yeah, being that there's only 9% of us. As long as they're flying you in first class. Well, I don't know. I guess. I, I don't know what it is. They I might, might have stuck you in the luggage department. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's really cool. Oh, Sadie, you see yourself? <laughs> this is looking at the yeah, like see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Take a good look at herself there. And uh, the magic of television, we have a bit of a delay on our screen here, so we can uh, yeah. Check um, Jonathan, Jonathan's asking about the old camper. Yeah, we have a new one. Uh, Neil, I, I guess uh, Jonathan didn't come in at the beginning, but yeah, we have the new. Yeah, there was there was uh, a woman that is one of the vendors at the marketplace there, Nicole. Uh, she Nikki. saw what happened to uh, Nikki. She saw what happened to the uh, the RV there with the fire bombing, and uh, she had come into possession through inheritance from her dad. This yep. uh, RV that looked very much like the one that we lost, yep. and so uh, we negotiated a good deal on it. I think she gave us a really good deal on she it. Did. And uh, yeah, it runs and everything. And in fact, it's only got forty nine thousand miles on it. Yeah. Although it's a, it's a little rough, it needs a tune up for sure. Well, and but it's, it's been around be for worth a while. it because it has the, the, only that that amount. I amount think of so. Miles yeah, on, right? sure. Yeah, yeah 100%. It, it'll be worth to get it fixed up and get the motor running good and stuff like that. Because then you can use it in the summertime too. Yeah. Right. So. So yeah. yeah, that's awesome, and that's what we got going on. And thank you so much to Nikki for helping us out with that. Um, there was an incident that happened here. Uh, either yesterday or the day before that I'm pretty dis disturbed about. Uh -huh. um, landlord, a good friend of the show, yeah. has uh, taken a job in one of the markets there on Hastings Street, yeah. um, providing cannabis as a harm reduction option for people. Yeah. And BPD took a little stroll through the marketplace. And arrested and him? They didn't arrest him, but they, they stole all of his stuff. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I mean, this is legalization, is it? Wow, eh? You know? They stole it all. They stole it all. Oh, wow. So, that's just disgusting as can be. Yep. Um, I, I don't he know what to say. I mean, me. I, I don't even... He, I mean, he sent me a happy face like a couple of days ago, so I thought things were all right. It would have been but, after that. I mean, he's after. all right with it, you know, but... Uh, yeah. But he's not. Because he's seen other people go through the same thing, right? Yeah, he so, told me. Yeah. So now I know what it feels like yeah, to get raided by the cops, and yeah. he said it, it doesn't make you feel very good. But he said he uh, he scolded that cop that did it. Yeah. He said bad things are going to happen to you. Yeah. He said I I have the ability to curse people. I've cursed <laughs> other officers in the past, and he, oh. he actually uh, told him of a couple of different instances where these cops ended up in serious uh, life si situations because you know the landlord field he cursed him. Well, you know. Well, you can't, can't say that. That's what he said. Wow. Yeah. I'm surprised. Maybe he just thought he was a good. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, he didn't take it. He seriously. said he said the cop uh, looked like he was not very happy about being told that. Yeah. Wow. Right. Yeah. 
Well, and you know, I mean, these guys, whether or not you tell them that or not, that's going to be in their karma. Yeah. You know, uh, he's a piece of shit for doing that. What the hell? Uh, who, who are they protecting? That's the big question here, right? Protecting because the big because we we are paying these police people to go around and intervene in certain things to protect people because yeah. that's what they're supposed to be all about. They're peace officers. They're supposed to bring peace, maybe where, where there isn't so much peace. Mm -hmm. Whatever. Who are they protecting by taking away the cannabis that the landlord had there, uh, you know, available for people? There who is. are they protecting? You know who they're protecting? They're protecting the other dealers in the neighborhood. That's it. That's it. Yeah. And and they're all through the neighborhood. They're not hard to find. Those same cops could easily go for a little walk and seize a whole bunch of stuff if they wanted to, but they don't. They don't. They're just trying to clamp down on those people offering cannabis. There's a red tent that sits at the corner of Maine and Hastings. Yeah. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Always operated by four or five people sitting there. They've got cigarettes. They, I'm told, they have the full range of different drugs that people want. Wow! Openly, all right there, and, and they, they've been there longer than us. That's all, and that's also probably because of what's happening on January the first, right? We're, we're decriminalizing two grams as of January first, 2024. So those people could be out there and only selling to two grams to everybody. And they sure, be, but they're, they're going to be themselves in possession of more than that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the, and I don't want these people arrested. No. I want them put out of business by a government that allows proper access to the things that people want for themselves that doesn't involve you having to go to some people under a tent selling you stuff out from underneath their jacket. Yeah. That's not the way to be buying stuff like but they, that. But we're saying that the cops aren't busting them, right? That's what I'm saying. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. They're going to they're gonna come after so not, well, not uh, an, 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 an elder indigenous person who has some of, you know, nature's sacred herb available for people in a, in a world where it's not easily available for people and they're going to make sure he can't do that mm. where the other people who have this other stuff that they're making easily available to people that happens to be at the at the source of our our public health pandemic even and yet they're not being interdicted as anywhere near the, like the cannabis people are like i'm in court coming up here and and, and two of my my colleagues as well for selling cannabis without a license, why aren't why aren't there a whole bunch of people on uh, in court for selling fentanyl without a license, yeah. or selling crack cocaine or crystal meth without a license? Yeah. You know what, why aren't these people in court? They're not hard to find, but for some reason, we have a government whose 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 value system isn't in line with the rest of the public's. <coughs> Their value system. <coughs> is in protecting the interests of rich people who want to sell cannabis at artificially inflated prices that are beyond belief. <laughs> yeah, way beyond belief. Way beyond belief. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, like, and, and, and even at that, you know, I mean, there's expensive ways to grow cannabis. We talked about this, you know, I, I like to qualify this yeah, because I have grower friends. Yes. And, and there's, there's grower friends that pay huge hydro bills yeah. that pay a good dollar for professional people to come in and, and clip their product, and, and they they spare no expense with the lights, with the the dehumidifiers, with the fans, with all the different equipment, all that stuff. Not to mention they're risking their own livelihood most of the time. I mean, many of them, in fact, uh, some of them might have licenses to do what they're doing, but they still could at any time, you know, lose all of that because mm -hmm. of this ridiculous uh, cannabis act and the laws that we have here. But. They're producing cannabis at considerably more expense than what farmers produce other things at. Considerably more. To the tune of probably a few hundred dollars per pound more than what it costs to produce strawberries or blueberries or raspberries or the rest of that. Which farmers are producing, by the way, for pennies on the pound. <coughs> Uh, it arrives in the stores, and after a few different uh, bumps in prices as people handle it along the way, we as consumers pay upwards to about $7 a pound for the very best of that stuff, and not much more. Mm -hmm. So that when, when growers and farmers want to now move indoors and use artificial sunlight that costs a lot, and buy a bunch of equipment, and pay trimmers and all the rest of it, it adds a few hundred dollars to the cost of producing that yeah. per pound. A few hundred dollars. 
there's math on it. There are graphs and scales, and there's, this has all been broken down by, by economists at this point, that show what it costs to produce cannabis under those conditions. And it's not more than $250 per pound. Wow. <coughs> wow. Yeah. That's still pretty high. That probably in the retail marketplace should fetch probably about a dollar a gram. Yeah. You know, $450 for a pound of something that the farmer spent $250 to produce. And that's some of the best stuff too, by the way. Mm -hmm. But the Canadian government, they they think that they should be able to maintain a price, let's say ten dollars a gram. They have some stuff that's less than that. I hear you can buy one hundred dollar ounces. Well, hundred dollar ounces. How much is that per gram? That's uh, sixteen hundred dollars for a pound. So that's about four dollars a gram. Yep. That's their cheap stuff, and they go way up from there. So I've seen uh, 18, and I've been told of $22 a gram. Wow, really? Wow, at government stores. Wow. And as they, as they continue <laughs> to add, I don't know, <laughs> really, I've, I've never paid it. I, I, like I say, I saw the one packaging that was $18 a gram, that was for some real high-end stuff from a dispensary up in Whistler. Uh, I've been told of $22 a gram, and I suspect that as they include more craft growers, these, yeah. these ultra mini grows, that they're going to have to raise the price even more for that. So we're up for around twenty five thousand or twenty five dollars a gram for cannabis. At twenty five dollars a gram, that's ten thousand dollars a pound. Wow! You can't tell me that <laughs> even these micro growers, even with all of the very most expensive equipment, are coming anywhere close to ten thousand dollars per pound no that they're producing. Or and, and maybe it maybe it gets marked up hundred percent. So now we're talking five thousand dollars a pound. Does it cost five thousand dollars a pound to produce this stuff? I say not a chance. Yeah. Not yeah. not even close. Yeah. Ten times less than that. Yep. Yeah. So the government is maintaining these artificial prices that are just so far out of whack. And and when they're they're that far, what they're far away from is the ability of people who don't have a lot of money who really need it to get it. Mm -hmm. And that's the big tragedy here. That's, that's where we've come full circle now. There's hundreds of thousands of Canadians that have doctors supporting their usage of cannabis yep. for medical oh, purposes. My doctor's office, the whole team is on board. <laughs> we've got numerous studies, so many different studies that have come out over the last decade showing the medical efficacy of cannabis for a variety of different things, including, and not least of which, is assistance in withdrawal to people that are addicted yep. to opioids. Yep. Powerful medicine for, you know, much needed in our society. Um, there's, there's no justification for the prohibition. In all of that disclosure that they gave us, there's nothing in there about a victim. No. You know, what were we reading, uh, you and I, just before the show? Um, there's this thing that's come out that's showing that, that, that for the amount of cannabis that's being sold, there's sort of a relative amount of alcohol that's not being sold. sold now. That's good. But the researcher from Brook University that was uh, the one quoted in the article said that they weren't sure yet about how the offsetting of harms caused by alcohol would be balanced by the harms caused by the use of cannabis. <laughs> really? Yeah. Really? Well, because, you know, I mean, there just isn't a lot of stuff going on with the, the harms of cannabis. There's a lot of fear-mongering to do mm -hmm. with what about the children. It probably hurts the developing brain. Mm -hmm. But I haven't heard anything else about anything else. No. I don't see any warnings on the cannabis that people are buying legally from cannabis stores, from the government, that say excessive use can hurt your liver, kidneys, yeah. damage brain function. I haven't yeah, seen anything cancer. like that, or cause cancer, or, cause cancer. Yeah. or anything like that, yeah. because none of that is true. Yeah. None of that is true. There's just no harms associated with cannabis of any significance that would ever justify prohibiting it 
or even over restricting it, let alone using the criminal law. <laughs> so we've kind of come full circle at this point. It's available for sale in stores without the same warnings as the alcohol and the commercial tobacco and the pharmaceutical drugs that are available for sale to us and have been for all the time that cannabis was prohibited. This is not only a much safer commodity, it is a safe commodity that is beneficial mm -hmm. for many of the things that these other non-safe commodities are responsible for harming people with. Yeah. So we've come full circle. It is time that, that we be apologized to uh, by these people that yeah. have been doing this. And yeah. it is time that they back the fuck off. Yeah. Get out of the way. Leave the marketplace to regulate itself like it did for 20-some yeah. years before they decided to legalize and regulate. Um, it is way overdue. This needs to happen. And so we'll see what we can do about that. We're going to be in court. Yep. Uh, next up, a week. In one week from one today. Week. So um, It's going to be at 2 o'clock. It's not going to be in the same courtroom. Let me see if I can just check on that and see if I've got an update from my lawyer. So the show may be a little late. late I don't think date. I do here. Right. The show might be a little late. Yeah. Uh, we'll I'll see what we come do. I'll right? let you guys know what's going on. That's for sure. I can do that. I didn't get it. I got yeah, a, yeah. I got a right. thumbs up to, uh, you know, I'd like to be able to announce on the show uh, which courtroom we're yeah. going to be in. <laughs> but I didn't get the actual uh, which courtroom. So... Um, Wow, if I, you're I, in I, Vancouver, I don't remember. I thought you said it's going to be in the same. Courtroom. I did, but I asked him that, and he said no to that. It's a no. So oh, okay, um, all right. Uh, you know, we want people there. We need people there. If you if you've been considering coming out to one of these uh, dates, this is now our eighth time. Do you have a little piece of paper? Uh, didn't get it. You didn't get that time. Walked out That's without strange, it. Strange, because he usually walks up and gives it to you, right? Yeah, didn't happen. Oh, um, yeah. One so, of George or Andrew got one, because I'll tell you what. Part Andrew we're... wasn't there. Okay. Uh, I'm pretty sure George uh, wasn't didn't take his. Uh, maybe. Okay. Yeah. We'll go ask him. Yeah. I don't have that information for you. What I can say is is that we would love to have you there. Mm -hmm. That if you're in the Vancouver area, if you can share this with people that are, um, of, of the eight appearances, this is now number nine coming up here. I believe Did we have seven. And this is eight. Um, I don't know. I, I, I lost. I, track. I, I've been keeping track. I'm just like, you'd, have, you'd, you'd yeah. have to ask those people that got a paycheck for every one of those uh, times. They'll yeah. be able to tell you a lot easier than me. Oh, yeah. But it's, it's eight or nine now that we're going back there. This is the one where we actually are going to have our lawyer uh, describe what we're doing to a judge and the Crown try to explain why they think this is in the public's interest to do what they're doing. Uh, I think this is, uh, uh, it should be powerful to watch. This is a... Uh, I call Are it. you going to get an opportunity to talk? Because he I, told I me I didn't even need to be go, there. So I don't think you're going to be able yeah, to. Yeah, he told me I so didn't even need to be there. You'll only be able to get the talk if it goes to trial. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or if I fire my lawyer. It, or if you fire, no, no, you don't want to fire a lawyer. Well, <laughs> it, might, it might be a strategic thing to do. I don't know. I'm going to talk to Jack about it. Really? I think I'm capable of talking for myself. I wouldn't fire him, fire him, of yeah, course. No, yeah. But he may just be my counsel. You know, he may uh, counsel and advise me as I well, present that's what he's doing this right story. Now. It is. Is right. he going to do as good a job as me? Well, the answer to that would be yes and no. Well, um, you know, in some ways he will both, because he he's, both, legal, yes, he's legal exactly. oriented, you both have. and he'll have his set of skills about how to properly present things and, exactly. and know more about and what he is knows important. Who you are. He does, so and I have faith in him. Now it comes to trust in me, our faith, right? I, I have faith and, in him. And if it doesn't that. work, you're going to be able to talk the next time around anyway, so don't fire him. Yeah, right? Yeah, and I'm not, yeah, I'm not yeah, all yeah. that invested yeah, either way. Yeah, yeah. I'm appalled that this is happening, that yeah. taxpayers are on the hook for this, that, that, the, uh, that the government would be so blind and ignorant and corrupt that they would think this is a good thing to do. They were not, not able to see through whatever screen they're looking through to recognize that we're just good people trying to do good things mm -hmm. and that we should be Same. probably rewarded and carried around on people's shoulders for a while, uh, especially if we could really do what we want to do, which is expand our program to get low barrier access stores available in those communities, easy access yep. where it's needed, and, set, and then see what happens. You know, there's people right across Canada, I'm told about it all the time, they're struggling, they need something like this. They've got areas of, you know, that are full of people that could really use some high dose edibles, but there's just no access. Let's see what happens if there was access, you know, in all yeah. of these places. Let's see if we can't kick the shit out of this this epidemic of overdose deaths here. Yeah. 
and, and uh, how people recover because uh, I mean, get, go through with withdrawals. They're all scared of the withdrawals, the pains and stuff like that. With the edibles, they're not getting that right. Yeah, their bodies are able to get through the days without a lot of the, the symptoms of withdrawals. And if we weren't having any good results, like, like Glenn's talking about, we wouldn't still be here. Exactly. It's been almost six years. Yes. This is not an easy neighborhood to be in. People get there's, mad when you're not there's, there. There's threats to us <laughs> yeah. all the time. We have to be always vigilant because this na- neighborhood is full of crazy people acting out. There's people that are attacked here regularly. And, and we, have, we have competitors. We have people that were, you know, perhaps on their turf or they think they might be. I've been here longer than anybody else, by the way, as far as I see yeah. it. The, over 20 years of, of working with Vandu. We had the Herb School before, 19 years ago. So that... Uh, you know, I feel that I've got street cred and that, that we're good here, but not everybody sees it that way. We don't know the risks to us. We see horrors here yeah. every day. We see things that horrify us. People that could easily be our family members that are struggling so badly with their mental health issues, with the way society is treating them, with the way things are for them, that it makes it very, very difficult to be here. Nobody's getting rich here. I make sure everybody does okay because I believe in that and I structured things that way. But I also structured things in a way that makes sure that nobody's getting taken advantage of, that the street is getting what they can get at prices that, that we can get it to them for as best we can. So there is no incentive here for us to keep on going. We've been firebombed, we've been threatened, we've been robbed, we've been broken into, we've had all these issues, we've been rejected by a government of public servants that we thought were going to help us at some point. From the municipal government that passed a motion to support us unanimously that, and has done nothing since to actually do that, other than some letters that they wrote perhaps to Ottawa and actually gave us a copy of one from a couple of the different councillors. But other than that, they've not exercised the power that they have to put us into a storefront with a license and allow us to operate while we negotiate with Health Canada without the fear and the risk of of police coming and arresting us. So right from the municipal government all the way to our prime minister and the federal government and Health Canada, we have been rejected. We have been, just their backs have been turned on us. It has been over six years, which means that we are suffering from the heat of the summer in an RV that has no electricity to the the, 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 the the harshness of winter, which we're going through again here, it's not easy. We have propane heaters, makes it better, but not the way it would be in a storefront. Mostly that we recognize that there's so much more that we could be doing that we're not able to do. We are having to be bystanders watching as many people can't get the help that we had, we could otherwise be able to give them if we were supported by government and we had what we needed to do that. So this is not easy for us to be here. And I speak on behalf of my whole team, the other people that are involved in helping us. This is not easy. This is something that we believe in because the exact reason that you just said before that, we see the rewards. We see these people that came to us drug sick and hopeless and now and they've got lives where they they got to jump in their step and they're happy. They've got weight on now and they're yeah. happy and they're, yeah. So, you know, and, and they thank us all day long and people tell us all day long how happy they are that we're here for them and thanking them us opioids. and telling us, please don't go away. Yeah, what keeps you them know? on the opioid system is not wanting to go through withdrawals. That's right? it. And now you've got a solution, right? And they're happy that you've got a solution. When they busted you, there were so many And we can't properly offer the solution either, by the okay. way. Yeah. You know, we're not doing the job that we should be doing here. I give people 420 milligrams every four days. Yep. That's not enough. Nope. That's not enough. It's a good start. It's a good boost. With a little bit of extra beyond that, most people can actually get through that withdrawal. I don't know that 100 milligrams is enough. Maybe if they save it up for you know, two or three or four times, and now they've they've got a couple thousand milligrams, now they can approach that that vortex of of, of withdrawal, that Mm -hmm. that four or five days of hell, the the seven levels of hell, all the rest of the way that they describe it here, you know, then they can get through that. What I wanted to do, what I've always wanted to do, is be able to give people everything that they need to be able to get what they need to get off these things. That's what I want. That's what the program was designed to do. I showed up with boxes of stuff to give away at Van Du early on yep. and had huge lineups of people that we had to distribute it to. So we portioned it out. 
I didn't think it was going to be that way. I thought I was going to have boxes of stuff, handfuls of people, and everybody was going to get what they needed, yeah. and we were going to be able to guide this, this handful of people through withdrawal. But instead, there was long lineups. 300. Hundreds, <laughs> Hundreds of people. Oh, wow. Right away. Oh. Not wanting to turn anyone away, but you have to when the boxes are empty. So we did the best job we could to decide how many people we were going to have to have for that day and how much we had to give out, and we would portion it into bags and yeah. give that much out. And you had the holy rollers. And we wouldn't and we wouldn't give them much counseling. We wanted to. But how do you give hundreds of people the counseling that they need? Yeah, you can't. It's very difficult. Yeah. So we tried to make it clear with the signage that we had about what the goal of the program was. And we would give a few moments of our time to everybody as best we could to tell them to start low and go slow. We could do so much more. Yep. So much more. And that's what's the most frustrating about all of this, is we had these grand visions and dreams. I did, and I shared them with other people who shared them with me. We have formed the Serious Hope Society. Mm -hmm. We had some great meetings, a couple of really great meetings, where we talked about the many, many things that we could do as a society with the aim to help people as best we could down here through cannabinoid therapeutics and other means, not just through cannabinoids. Um, speaking of Andu, were you able to find out if Evie's going to be talking to them? I, or they're going to be talking to him? I didn't go there and pursue that. No, uh, you can give him a call. I, I will. Yeah. You know, I'll see well, if, he's, if there's anything you know, coming up. It's Tuesday. It may have already done it, right? It may have already done it. Yeah. I know you said this week. I you know, a news I, item, right? Yeah. So. I want a real meeting with these people. And, and I, want, I want Shirley Malcolmson to give me a call and have a meeting with me. Why won't you, Shirley? I don't understand. I, I now I'm bugging her, right? Yeah. I'm, bu I'm like she's. I'm a Facebook. I'm a Facebook friend. Yeah. She posts on there. Yeah. And I post. Please meet with me. Yeah. And talk about the CSP. Yeah. Why won't you meet with me and talk about the CSP on, on her page? On on the threads that yeah. are there where she posts. Oh, she's doing certain things. Yeah. I'm being polite and nice about it. Yeah. I've sent her personal emails. I've phoned the office numerous times since she wow. was given that position. She's the Minister of Mental Health and Addictions Where do we find in her? British well, Columbia. Yeah, well, I'm waiting for her to post something local. She's in Nanaimo, I think, yesterday okay. with something there going on. Okay. Uh, helping young people with mental health issues. Yeah, we could do it that way. But uh, and, like, I don't want to have to ambush her. That's the thing. That's what I'm saying. That's you know, right. that's what we always used to have to do. I've, I've put in enough time now, and we've demonstrated successfully enough now, that I deserve a meeting with these people. I deserve to be talked to. Yeah. You're, yeah. I'm not happy. No. You know? No. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a frontline worker here right through the pandemic where we were deemed an essential service, and darn it, we know we are. Yeah. Holy smokes. In fact, when you see in the winter time, like the, like we got going right now, it's, it's bitterly cold out there. Um, the people that are here coming to this RV that are standing out early in the morning to get there as soon as we open, yeah. this is an essential service for yeah. people. Well, there's a lot of, I was amazed at how many people were just lined up waiting for the tent. Yeah. Where's, the, where's the RV? With how what happened and the tent was there. Some people were, oh no, it's not here. And you're right? It's like, oh no, we got the tent. So I hope Jack can do a good job for us of explaining to the judge that uh, we did what should have been licensed a long time ago. Yeah. We did what we did, we continued to do what we did after licenses were promised, once licenses were needed, and then licenses were applied for. Yeah. So I hope he makes that point really clear, that we've had licenses pending by both municipal and federal governments that have told us that they will license us. And then they're working And on then it. they haven't. And then they're working on and it. And they're working hard every day on it. Yeah. But the most important thing is, is that we can't quit doing what we're doing in the meantime. We couldn't just, just stop and say, oh, well, we need licenses and we don't have them yet. Oh, well, we can't do what we're doing now. No, we can't save people's lives. Sorry. For all these years. I know that for years we've been helping you, and then without us, you're probably going to go back and buy some of that other stuff that could kill you, but your federal government cares about you, and, <laughs> and what we're doing must not be safe. Oh, <laughs> right, yeah. So that's why we had to demonstrate it. That's what we've been demonstrating not just that it works but that it's safe that there's nobody that's been harmed yep. there's a whole bunch of people that I'm sure would tell you that at the first go they ate too much yes and they didn't like it yep. 
and they didn't do it again, because that's what you do, you self-regulate when you experience something like that. Unfortunately, some people's version of self-regulating is to never do that again. <laughs> and uh, th yeah. that's our big problem here, is we gotta make sure that people don't eat so much to begin with that they don't wanna do it again, because that's not a nice experience. Yeah. But, you know, other than that, you don't know what to expect. there's no harm going on here. Yeah. There's a whole lot of good, there's no harm. It's the head and the body. The body's not going to cooperate. You're like, oh, I won't work. And you begin to panic. Yeah. So what do we say? Go low. Start low. Go ahead. Go Start slow. low. Go slow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My head felt so thick when I ate too much that one time in Toronto. You? I've never eaten too much. I've been lucky, so... Part of, part of it was drinking. Uh, huh? Part oh, of it was drinking. Drinking, ah, geez. But not drinking alcohol. I've, I've learned... But oh. not drinking alcohol. Oh, okay. It was a, a cannabis-infused milkshake at the... Oh, at the, so you had the at the Kindred oh, Cafe in Toronto. Oh, okay, all right. So all they right, preyed right. on my sweet tooth. Wow. <laughs> I don't know if you've seen this, but uh, uh, they got Sylvester Stallone in a new show called Tulsa King. Oh, yeah. And he's a... He's a mafia guy trying in, in, in Tulsa to take over the weed shop business ah. and getting money from it and stuff like that. Gee. So he was making a deal with Jimmy the grower and he's eating this apricot sauce. Yeah. And right, he's like, oh, this is really good in this semester floor thing. So after they make the deal, he says, I gotta let you know that that sauce is medicated. <laughs> All right, and it was funny. Did it get him a better deal? Oh, uh, well, no, no, he already had a good deal before, right? Because uh, so the slow has been doing the big, the, the tough guy. You can, you have to answer yes or no by the time I finish swallowing this cracker, right? So do the math, he said, because he offered the deal, and you literally have, have an answer by the time I. All this cracker, right? So, yeah. if you get a chance to check it out, it's pretty good. It's all low weed, so, all so weed. Yeah, he's smoking in the car. And, oh, yeah, it's funny, yeah, and, and it's good. So, we'll see. Yeah, uh, he, yeah. Sleep, he sleeps with some girl just uh, after he gets into Tulsa and she turns out to be a, a cop. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, she thought he was a lot younger and she's in her 40s and he she says, How old are you? and she's like, He goes 75 and she wants to get out of the hotel room real quick. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then they're all sitting around the table, and his picture comes up that he's come into the area, and that he's there, right? And she's like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so check out Tulsa King if you can. <laughs> Tulsa King, I guess we're promoting movies now. Well, I don't know. We, we're uh, about Cisco weed, and Ebert. Right? Yeah, Cisco we, and Ebert here. Yeah, yeah, right. Re yeah. Reincarnated. <laughs> uh, one thumbs up because the other half didn't even see the movie yet. So we will have to check that out. Oh, cool. It's a... Uh, it's quite the story, you know, this whole thing that's been going on for all this time. It, it really, uh, it really needs to be told, um, and 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 the government needs to be exposed, and the corporations need to be exposed mm -hmm. for all of this. Yep. That, that's a big story. I'm hoping that comes out pretty soon. I don't know. Wow. Well, uh, anyway, I, I, I'm so hearing what rumblings else that they're trying to shut down the whole medical marijuana thing. Uh, the Health Canada's trying to get that done and get rid of that. Uh, That's terrible. I hope you guys uh, filled out that survey. Yeah. I see that Oregon has had a number of different recalls yeah. uh, due to I pesticides. Hear Connecticut's just making it uh, legal now. Are in they? Connecticut, yeah. Legal in the same framework as all these other jurisdictions like where uh, you know, no, it's all about not... licensing and fees uh, and high know, prices just, yeah. and, and eliminating the, uh, the poor people and stuff. We need to stop this corporatization of, of uh, weed. It's uh, <laughs> free the weed. Free the weed, man. Free, free the, the weed. People, free the weed. Yeah. Yeah. People going to grow. People yeah. should be able to grow. Let my people grow. That's it. <clears throat> Let our people grow. Yep. There was... Uh, there was that moment in time back where uh, I had put the Freedom Tour on hold for a few years. Uh, my dad wasn't well. I did uh, three years in a row of uh, spending five and a half months on Canadian highways, uh, mm -hmm. inline skating a good portion of the, the distance between here and Ottawa. I ended up doing over 3,000 miles on Canadian highways. Wow. And uh, so then uh, I started the fourth year. I, I inline skated the Malahat mountain range, one of my favorite things to do uh, for the fourth year in a row. But by the time I got back into Vancouver, it was clear to me that there was a lot of things not, not coming together like it always had in the years before. And uh, my dad was the, the main uh, thing for me where he was uh, looking like he was on his last legs. And I didn't want to be halfway across Canada and yeah, have my dad die on me, you know. And so uh, 
I put the, the tour on hold there and it ended up being for uh, two and a half years that uh, my dad uh, lived until he passed on. I was so glad to have that time with him. It was incredible. And uh, it was shortly after he had passed away that uh, we were just getting all these things in order and I was considering what I was going to do, you know, now in my life. Um, and then I got a call from uh, one of my supporters back east and uh, he was asking me if I was going to come back and do any more freedom tour educational stuff uh, in the future. And I had already been thinking about it myself anyway because the government had come up with the, uh, they were going to eliminate the people growing for themselves and there was mandatory minimums going to be uh, involved in prison sentences for wow. people that had, uh, you know, over, <coughs> over a certain amount of plants. Yeah. And so uh, wow. with that in mind, I get this phone call and... On the TV downstairs at my dad's place there, he had the, the big TV room, and the TV on the TV, they were playing an old movie of uh, Charlton Heston yeah. being Moses. Oh. And uh, he's standing up there on the big rock, and he's got the staff, yeah, yeah. and he's saying uh, to the Egyptians, let my people go. Yeah. And it all just kind of hit me at that moment that that is what I was going to be doing now that dad had passed away. I was going to go back and do another freedom tour. And that uh, the theme of the Freedom Tour was going to be let our people grow. Nice, nice. So uh, yeah, yeah that, that was a moment in time. Uh, there, we're, we're being told that we're amazing online. <laughs> I, I, in what way? Uh, I don't know. It's, it's uh, I have to read what Jonathan was saying. How much anyway. money do they want? Uh, they, they met us. They, he's met us both. Then how much money do they want? <laughs> I'm always looking for motives. You know? <laughs> I, uh, yeah, Jonathan Watson. I've had the pleasure to meet Glenn, and he's an amazing person. So is Neil. Well, oh, thank, nice. thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Oh, we'll I think that. everybody's an amazing person. Yeah, great. you're all amazing. Right? Yeah. Oh, I, I wish you all, uh, you know, the best of luck in being your true amazing selves. And yeah. um, I, I think for. For me personally, I can say I was lucky. I think I, I think we're all lucky. Oh. You know, if we're if we're sitting here right now smoking weed, talking about things, uh, you know, dressed in warm clothes in the winter yep. time inside a building that's heated, we're in paradise. We're we're very lucky. <laughs> right, you know? compared to somewhere else where yeah. it's illegal, they don't have the shit that we have. They don't drive cars. They don't have a laptop, a, ca a camera, or a show. Right. Yeah. Well, and I think to all the people throughout history, for the, the millennia before us, and how, how life was a struggle for everybody. And like I say, if you're in inside a building, you got food in your belly, and you're dressed warm in the wintertime, and you're smoking weed, and all of these things. Yeah. We are we are really, really so blessed to, to be here. I had a, another point I was about to make, and I forgot. <laughs> you were going, that's what Jesus um, is. No, the point, <laughs> the, the point is, is that... Uh, we are inside a building dressed warm in the wintertime, yep. smoking weed with all the rest of it. Yep. And right outside that door, uh, within, a, within a, about a half mile radius all around us, there's literally thousands of people that have none of it. Nope. Um, they don't have warm clothes, they're not uh, in a warm space, uh, their, their bellies are not full, and, and they're so huh. broken um, living in, tents. You know, in, in, in what they're able to think about. Um, they've been traumatized. They're being traumatized at this moment. It's been a series of traumas mm -hmm. for a long time in their lives as they get bashed around by, you know, the, the meaner elements of society based on whatever it is that their liability is. And they get bashed around by governments who really don't care about them. And they find that out. Once, you know, for the main people, the, the mainstream people in Canada who get to go to work every day and they don't get to, you know, they don't get some serious problem going on where they have to deal with the Health Canada or a government ministry or the hospitals or in the medical profession, so many of our systems that are broken in this country that you don't get to experience the troubles that those things are in until you have something bad happen to you. And there's a lot of people that pretty much go through their lives without recognizing any of that. But for those people on the fringe, man, for those people that are minorities, for those people that have bad things happen to them and they need government assistance, uh, it is not a panacea. No. Uh, you know, it is uh, it is stigmatization, and it is a, um, uh, what's the word that I'm looking for? Um, it's disgraceful. But I mean, when, <laughs> when people are discriminated against, discrimination, it's, it's discrimination. Yeah. You're discriminated against for being poor. You're discriminated against for being disabled. You're discriminated against for being and colors. 
and attitudes that, that, that other people don't like and all of these different things. You're stigmatized for what you try to do about that. If you, if you are in pain, if you're traumatized and you're seeking help and you end up being uh, involved with, with substances that uh, make you a druggie or a drug addict, now you're stigmatized like crazy. You, you try to go to the hospitals when you've got a legitimate medical concern and you've been labeled a drug addict and see what kind of help you get there. <laughs> they they you know? give you aspirin. Yeah, and they, they, <laughs> they, they you kick your aspirin. butt right the heck out of there fast. Right. And, and, and they're the ones who may do that by, by, cause you got In many hurt. cases. They gave you the first pills, right? Yeah, they, they don't you know, see any of that. They paid for it, right? So, and now, now, now they're here, right? No, they don't see any of that. No. It's institutionalized. It's, it permeates throughout our society. This is just the way that it is. Yeah. So, uh, that sucks. You know, I, I've, been, <laughs> I've been very lucky and I am very aware of numerous points in my life where it could have gone the other way. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was involved in bad things uh, right from the time when I was, well, at 10 years old I started smoking cigarettes, not too far from here, and I yeah. own 28. And I used to come down here on my bike, bicycle sometimes, just a little kid, yeah. and, and peek into the peep shows and then, you know, I... Oh, Go to the bookstores. I had my bike stolen from in front of a bookstore right over here on Hastings, just one block. It was right wow. there, and I'd be in there trying to look at uh, magazines and things like I probably shouldn't have been. But <laughs> no. What can well, I say? I, I have no idea where I had these drives from. It's human nature. It's what got yeah. us here: is sex and, yeah. and and love and lust and all of those things. Yep. And I certainly had that going on. And that's what I mean. I could have taken numerous different bad turns in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, that day that I had my bike stolen here. Uh, I was only like 11 years old, and, and now I'm really distraught. My bike is gone. Uh, I'm where I shouldn't be, and uh, and here this guy, he's going to help me. He's going to befriend me, and uh, uh, I forget what he asked me, but he wanted me to go up to his room and look at magazines or something. And I no, no, quick, no, 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 quickly no, got no, out yeah, of there, yeah, you know. Yeah, no, uh, no. Another time at 20 on 28th, uh, heading up to Nanaimo from a stockaders meeting at the local People's Fellowship Church down at the end there that my grandparents uh, helped to build and were members of for such a long time. Uh, I was a little boy, uh, you know, 12, 11 years old, uh, stockaders, and. Uh, walking back to my house that was on the Nanaimo Street at the top of the hill mm -hmm. and I'm approached by a person who says that they forgot their glasses and they, uh, can't, they can't see oh and, they, and they need to go to the grocery store <laughs> and I tell them that the grocery store is just at the top of the street at Nanaimo yeah. and then down to the left where the foundry is now it's the uh, Nanaimo Street Skytrain station yeah. but uh, we get up there and I'm, I'm pointing at where it is I can see it he yeah. says I, I really can't see where that is would you mind walking me down there and I said, uh, well, just a minute, I gotta, I gotta let my mom know yeah. that my house was right there. Yeah. So I ran in and I said, mom, I'm gonna help this guy find the store. Yeah. And then now we're getting closer to the store and he's got his hands in his jacket pocket and he's asking me if me and my friends ever play doctor. Oh. And I can see a knife blade flash in his coat pocket. Wow. And I just said, hey, I think that's my mom calling. Go. There's the store, mister. Yeah. And I ran out of there, and Dad and I, we scoured the neighborhood. We looked in parked cars and behind bushes and up and wow. down streets, you know, to see if we could find this guy. My yeah. dad was pretty serious yeah, about it. Pretty, pretty pissed at the so, dad, I mean, too, yeah. But way, way worse than that was that, you know, I started smoking at 10 years of age. And my, my right-wing Protestant parents, they knew, you know, but uh, I would deny it and lie to them and tell them I was just sitting at the bus stop and a guy was smoking next to me. And that was my story every time. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> And so they decided they had to get get me out of Vancouver, like yeah. get this kid out of out of East Vancouver because there's bad influences all over the place here, and they were smoking is. cigarettes and getting in trouble. And so they moved me out to Surrey, right, <laughs> next, right next to Grandpa and Grandma's house in Birdland. And uh, oh yeah, I yeah I used to live there at Holly Park. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I got in lots of trouble in Holly Park. <laughs> I got I got drunk and climbed the, the barbed wire fence we there and cut the, my hands all up and tried to go swimming when, there. And when Kevin home, was yeah. like a, two or three years old, we lived in, um, in the townhouses there. Oh, is that Park. right? Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's very interesting. Yeah, so you're in so, my neighborhood. Well, <laughs> pretty much, yeah. Or, well. You know, before you were there, but yeah. Uh, but yeah, I was there, and boy. You know, I mean, I, they stepped it up a notch for me getting into trouble coming <laughs> out here. 
or out to Surrey rather. Um, you know, yeah. I was I was running with gangs. We were beating yeah. people up. We were driving in cars to Langley to have gang fights. Uh, there was wow, break-ins eh? going on. I was breaking into cars to steal liquor. I was getting drunk all the time. Wow. Um, yeah, you know, I, wow. and and then came uh, uh, hockey. Yeah. Thank God it for hockey. You. you know, it saved me. My my cousin made the National Hockey League. Um, he contacted me. He sent me equipment through his cousin, his brother Wayne in, in Alberta. There, um, I paid my own way. I, I was I was fortunate that I was a bit of an entrepreneur at a young age. I was selling Christmas cards uh, door to door. I, I worked at a gas station. I had my own money because my dad would not pay for hockey gear and pay for me to play hockey. No wow. But uh, I had the gear. I made the money to pay for the the admission, and I got playing hockey. And you know, my my cousin. Changed my life. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's you're here yeah, today. He you're totally, he totally, uh, yeah. I, don't, I don't know that he knows. I, you know, I wrote him a long letter one time, and I, I didn't even send it to him. <laughs> uh, I did get to talk to him a few times when he was here, and I brought Dan to see him when he was part of the Chicago alumni. Yeah, and um, and I and I did get to talk. You should send that letter. I, well, he died. Oh, he died. Oh, okay. he died oh, back in two thousand and five. Right. Well, then you should know. In a car accident, yeah. he was. Uh, oh, you told me that story. Yeah, yes. he was with yeah, uh, with another person, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I don't remember his name now. It's no. terrible. But we looked it up one day. We uh, did. Yes. yes, we did. Yes. But yeah, he changed remember. my life. Uh, he got me on a different track. He got me with a different group of people, uh, doing different things. You know, getting up early in the morning and going to hockey practice and yep. uh, and going uh, from town to town playing. I was playing for the rep teams. And uh, it, it. It, it just it really helped me. So, and so many other things, right? Yeah. Like there was several different things along the way. When my marriage broke up, I, I was like, man, I can sure see why people crawl into a bottle. Mm -hmm. You know, when their marriage breaks up, it was such yeah. a horrible thing. I'm a sensitive guy. I, I never thought my marriage would end. I mean, it should have ended. It was it needed to end. My wife needed to to be in a space on her own where she could work out her stuff. And, yeah. and it just is what it is. And I, I accept that. But, uh, you know, to have my kids taken from me and all the things that happen when you go through a divorce, uh, that was really hard. And all these other things. And I meet these people down here, and and they went through similar things, yeah. but they didn't come out of it the way I did. No. They didn't have weed, for example, when no. my marriage broke up to keep me out of that, that bottle, you yeah. know. Uh, they didn't have a cousin that made the National Hockey League that kept them from running yeah. with the gangs that they were running That's with. That's the opposite, you know, right? Yeah, it's like there, there's so many... You turns would, along the way where I could have been, you know, yeah. so, man, I'm so blessed and that's why I'm here doing what I'm doing is, you know, these people, they need somebody who managed to have something they didn't have at that moment when they went that way and I was able to go that way mm. to come and give back something. And, that, and that's so true yeah. for a lot of the people that uh, there, there are helping are me here. people who have had the, the uh, opportunity where a coach or somebody has changed their life by going to do a sport to... Right, but you just don't know those people personally, right? Yeah, but there, there are similar Tons stories. Of them. People yeah. want to give back when, yeah. like, when they're boxing. Just, just, boxing is, like a, is one of the biggest ones where they take a lot of people. From the and street. so that's true for for so many people that are associated with me here. Yeah, like we're a large group of people. I have a team of of ten people now that uh, you know take shifts in the RV. Yeah, um, there's uh, about ten other people that have come and gone over the last uh, number of years that we've been doing this in the last two and a half years since we went to having the store. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm a dad. I always got to oh, clean the store. Man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's really close to my heart. This stuff is really close to my heart. And I'm, I'm sorry that I'm not as composed as uh, maybe I should be sometimes. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it's really hard down here because I see myself. I yeah. see people that I knew along the way. I see how it could have been different for these people. We talked last week on the show about some people that I met down here that are here because of weed. Mm -hmm. That they got a minor weed bust yeah. that turned into a major event in their life. Yeah. That, uh, you know, six months in jail and now they don't have housing. Wow. Uh, the family turns their back on them. Uh, wow. they're, you know, they're labeled oh, as a criminal, the they can't get a job, you know, I mean, so many different things down here where I see that, you know, I, I need to be here helping here because mm -hmm. for me, I had a better life, you know, and I, and I want to say that this team of people that work with me, not just the 20 people that I just mentioned that, yeah. have, that have worked and do work here now, but the dozens of people that have been providing us with donations for the CSP since mm -hmm. the beginning. 
the bakers. Uh, yeah, those bakers and, and yeah. you know, so many people and, and other people in other roles as well, the lawyers, I guess. That, you know, and, and many of these people have a personal connection that wants them to help us do what we're doing here. Uh, this is a team effort of a bunch of people that are motivated to help because they know how lucky they are. Yeah. And they've either lost loved ones or see that this could have been them yeah. and all of these other things. they want to share their experience so that hopefully that person might be able to get on the same path as they did, right? Exactly. You just want to pay it forward, right? Because, hey, this happened to me, it saved me. You know? So if Health Canada is going to tell me that we need to stop doing what we're doing the way that we're doing it, that we need to get our, our supplies from licensed producers in packaging and with taxes on it and all very sterile and, uh, and, and, and dehumanized by the time it gets to the end consumer here, then they should really rethink that because those people that are helping me need to have a way to give back. They, they, are, they, are, they are feeling blessed because they have a vehicle that will allow them to take part in something that, that contributes to this, this social problem that we have here. Um, so they need to license our suppliers. They need to allow for individual bakers to be able to contribute in yeah. some reasonable way. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm all for food safe, I'm all for proper packaging, yeah. but I'm not for taking the human element out of this. I'm not for eliminating that small operation of a, of a person or a family from their home, that, that, from their home yeah. that wants to be able to give back and help here. We need to be able to facilitate those people uh, doing something to help here. Yeah. Uh, so. Anyway, I hope that that's all taken into account by the powers that be when they do decide to properly scrutinize us and give us a license, that uh, that we'll be able to communicate these things to them, that they'll be receptive to that, that, uh, you know. Just let us continue to do it the way we've been doing it. We don't really yeah. need their weed. <laughs> we don't. If they were going you know, like, to decide that this is something that works yeah. and, and should be encouraged, then I'm the one, and we are the ones how that they should be consulting with as to how to do this. Yeah, we don't. We shouldn't be really consulting much with Health Canada about how they think that we it should, should do this. Way, yeah. it should be the other way around. Yeah. they should come and sit down and say, "We can see that you're having great success here. Yeah, how can we help you do that even better?" Yeah, or let's get into all all the Canadians on board with this, or you know, that are suffering in the same way. We right? need to allow this everywhere where it's in. <laughs> That's what they said. Know. Well, we can't. Oh, we're having a problem doing that because. You know, other people want to do what you want. That's what they do. said. They I said know, it's complicated. That was really cool. That was a quote. Other people, right? yeah, that's a quote. <laughs> that's a quote. Mr. That's Benoit cool. Seguin. Yeah. He, like, he said right out loud. He said, you know, this is, <laughs> this is, we will try to have your licenses figured out by early January. He yeah. said, he said they apologized for already being, you know, so long. It had been three months by that time since we had applied and people's lives were at stake after all. So he apologized for taking so long. Said that it would probably be early January, yeah. but it was complicated because yeah. if we did it, other people would want to do the same thing. Yeah. And, you know, how would they say no to those people? Oh, that guy should be a politician. Wow. <laughs> he really wow. put us off, eh? Yeah. I don't know what good Health Canada is. I don't know what it is that they're good at, uh, but they're pretty good at finding people that can toe the line and hold the, hold the bar and not allow for uh, you know things different than what they deem to be the right way to do it. Yeah. Because uh, you know he's done a pretty good job over these years of fending off uh, myself and John Conroy, uh, and uh, maintaining his stance uh, so far at least that uh, they can't be having cannabis uh, dispensed to people who don't have a doctor supporting their choice, and that uh, any cannabis that is dispensed has to be done legally. And that would mean uh, no high dose edibles, and that all the cannabis would have to come from licensed producers, and and likely subject to all of the different requirements that keep the prices up and up and up on that product. So, um, and my stance is is uh, I won't allow, uh, I, I won't concede to something that's going to raise our prices mm -hmm. or lower our quality or our ability to help people. And so I can't turn my back on what would be in the 95% range of people that, that we're already helping right now and have been for quite a while here, uh, I can't turn my back on those people because yep. they can't or won't get a doctor on board with what their choice is with high-dose edibles. 
and I, I won't restrict it to low dose edibles. You can't even um, get high dose edibles from the government. Well, that's what I mean. They yeah. don't have that available. Yeah. yeah. And so they would have to do some things to allow for what we have going on here with with hundreds of and of milligrams. In some cases, we have uh, one pack of six gummies totaling 800 milligrams that yeah. is very popular here amongst the people using it to offset the use of hard drugs. Yeah. yeah. You know, 800 milligrams, that must scare the hell out of Health Canada. Yeah. But it doesn't scare the hell out of the people here that need that to use it for yeah. what they're using it for. And and honestly, uh, even if that high a dosage was to be uh, gotten into the hands and, and mouths of, of children, there wouldn't be a death. There wouldn't be long-term health consequences. There wouldn't be anything like that. Uh, this stuff is not dangerous like so much of the pharmaceutical medicine is, like like alcohol can be in its extremes, and all of these other things. It is not dangerous like that at nope. all. Nope. So 41 proper, years of use right here. Proper yep. labeling, proper education. Um, you know, we don't want kids doing 800 milligrams nope. of, uh, nope. of edibles. Uh, you know, that's a scary experience for yeah. parents. It's, uh, no. it's not yeah. something that anybody should do to a, a yeah. young person. It, yeah their rights are definitely infringed if somebody imposes that Thanks. sort of an impairment on them. Yeah. Uh, so it shouldn't happen. Don't do it. Try That's your scary. best not to let that happen. <laughs> wow. But it doesn't mean that you can't go and buy, you know, whiskey or vodka or tequila yeah. because tequila children over. might get into it and they might get harmed by it. It doesn't mean that adults can't go and access that stuff. It means that you put out warnings about, you know, keeping it out of the hands of children. You put age limits on yeah. you can access it through, you know, through consumption spaces and, and, and purchasing places. That's how you do that. Um, you don't say adults can't have these yeah. things. And for them to deny high-dose edibles to the many, many medical users of cannabis and to the many, many people that would otherwise use it to escape addiction, that is... Um, that, that is uh, cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, that is a serious uh, violation. That is violence against those people to yeah. force them to continue yeah. to suffer yeah. without yeah. allowing them access to what would ease their, their suffering. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it is a really rotten thing to do. And when it's being done in the name of money, mm -hmm. well, now well, it's corrupt. It is, right? And it's now money. it's a crime. Yeah. And now it really needs to stop. Keep them so. in the pharmacy system, not, not healthy and... And producing stuff, or producing, or being a productive citizen, right? Exactly. Yeah. Well, oh. there's so much more we can talk about, as always, and we do talk about some of the same things every week because these things are the theme of, of what we're doing here, yep. and it's important. But uh, next week will be interesting. Next week we'll have the results of that court case, or we might not have results other than what happened during that proceeding, as long as well, we don't put we'll, a publication we'll ban we on it. Come back on the twentieth. Yeah, that's right. right. So, that's right. so yeah, we'll yeah we'll have some information. We'll have a result. We, we we because it'll either be that we don't have to go on back on the twentieth instead of trial date, or we yeah, have well, to they, go on the twentieth. They, they might give trial that date. verdict at the end of the proceedings that to, day. They well, no, to. they would have to do it before the twentieth, and then probably within no. a few days of the twentieth. Oh, 20th. you think so? Well, they might have a time window there of well, five I'm days. The I'm not, I, I'm that's really, a week later. I don't know what a pre. I've never been to a pre trial, so yeah, if I have or not, yeah. Because so, uh, I thought all the information gets out and then the judge will decide right there if it goes forward or not. And he tells you right there. And is it going to be, uh, you know, uh, actors on TV screens and a judge at a desk? Well, it'd be is, a it gonna be, is it going to be in a room? I mean, he said I could go. He, he didn't say I couldn't go. Yeah. He said I don't have to go. Yeah. But if I can go, and that yeah. would indicate that I can and George and Andrew, yeah. uh, that would indicate to me that, uh, that it's a room big enough for a couple people in there, mm -hmm. but we don't know if it's going to be in a room big enough for a lot so of people. So it's in a room, not, not a court? Right? I don't know. Oh, you don't know. I don't know. We'll I was out. waiting for uh, you know clarification, which hasn't happened, unless it's yeah. happened, I can't hear my phone because I turned my sound off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm going to do one more quick check. Just, just, check. Just, just wait like that. Nope, not no. there. All right. So... Uh, you know, I don't know, but please come down uh, to the courthouse there. If you're in the Vancouver area, we would yeah. really like some support. Um, I think it's going to be entertaining. I think that uh, we're going to continue to see this spectacle of corruption unfold right before our eyes, uh, and, and maybe in very profound ways. We'll see what sort of evidence that the, the Crown and how they're going to present that. Um, 
maybe we're going to have a courtroom where we can have a couple of dozen people in there. That would be great. That is so awesome when, uh, you know, you've got all that, that those people there yeah. and the judge knows and the crown knows that these are people that are supporting you and, you know, people in wheelchairs, people with gray hair, people with, with <laughs> nice dispositions, you know, these are all ways to sway the courts and we would really appreciate to have that kind of support yep. uh, as well as the fact of I think we're going to see something and, and witness something that uh, is historic uh, one way or the other either in them uh, finally deciding that uh, they should withdraw the charges or the, or the judge instructs them to do that yep. uh, or uh, or we continue on and, and now we continue on down the road where my lawyer tells me we're going to need twenty five to thirty thousand dollars raise to be able to uh, you know, provide the proper witnesses and evidence that needs to happen uh, to counter all of that that Health Canada is going to do uh, in their effort to prove that we were selling without a license. Uh, we'll see uh, what happens here, but I sure hope we get a bunch of people there. Uh, this is the one that, that matters. Uh, the other the other court dates, it was good to have hey. people there, but that wasn't a judge that was hearing anything. That did, it wasn't ever a judge that knew anything. It was really good for our spirits to have mm. people there that got up and left in a, in a, in a big group whenever when it was over. But it was always just to set dates, and we always knew that. This time is different. This is where there's going to be a couple hours spent talking about, uh, you know, what it is that we are all about and what it is that the crown is all about. Their evidence your evidence. Yeah, right? that yes. should be very, very interesting. Okay. And even if it's boring, we could sure use your support. So. <laughs> and the other thing is, yeah. is that if it's not going to be a, a large courtroom, if we can't facilitate all of the people that show up there that want to come in, yeah. um, well, we're still going to have Ben coming out and reporting a little bit about what's going on in there, for one thing. Uh -huh. But also that, uh, you know, we're going to have a good session out front. Yeah. Uh, we're going to have some signs. Sure, we're going to have some, you know, it's, it's a good opportunity to have a demonstration. Yeah. You know, when was the last time you were at a good demonstration with a bunch of other people? I just heard that David Eby changed his mind about autism because everybody was protesting in front of his office. Really? Yes. Nice. So he had to some new plan for all these kids. Yeah, they had, they had cut they back uh, services for people. His mind because well, he should have, from what year. I heard. It took a year. Yeah, I heard yes. CKNW, they had a few uh, parents on of people that yeah. were really, really concerned about so the changes that were being made. It is what we got to do. This is what we got to do. There's no other way around it if, if we don't get out and demonstrate if we don't yeah. have our voices heard if we don't unite to the point where we get critical mass and we get enough people to, to sway the day then the day will not be swayed and these people will continue on with their agenda of control and taking our rights away and being able to exploit us and and, and use us for all that we're able to be used for yeah. we need to to get together and demonstrate and be heard so this is a great opportunity coming up a week from today two o'clock Come on down. I mean, 1.30, 1 o'clock, we're going to be out in front of the courthouse there. We're going to be having sessions. We're going to be doing some live uh, broadcasts and live streaming. And, and, and I'd love to have a bunch of people there. I'd love to have those people that support us that can get down there to come on down there. And, uh, and let's, let's make a show of this and let's, uh, let, let's stop this before it goes much farther. Because without that, uh, the Crown will likely uh, have their way and we'll waste a whole bunch more tax dollars um, dragging my sorry butt into court and, uh, and and trying to make a criminal out of me and George and Andrew and, and all the rest of us because this isn't just George and, and me and Andrew it's it's uh, the twenty some people that have all worked in that RV uh, over the two and a half years that we've been here doing that uh, and and probably the bakers as well that are all now indicted in, in this that mm -hmm. uh, you know we're all a bunch of criminals none of us should have been doing what we were doing uh, the government knows best. And maybe that's the ruling that they're going to get here. You know, I, I really hope not. No. Uh, but if none of us uh, do anything, if we all well, just, it, uh, you know, step aside and let them have their way, then that is what they're going to do. And we won't have low barrier access to cannabis anytime soon. Uh, we need to keep the fight going. We need to bring it to them in a way that will, like you say, bring enough people in front of an office and make a fuss about it. Yeah. And we can change people's we minds. We can change people's minds. Yeah. Right? yeah. yeah. Yep. All right. All right. So I'll see you next week, sir. And uh, uh, yeah, we'll yeah, have lots to say for sure. Little, yeah, a little earlier. All right. Very good. All right. Cheers. Cheers. So what it's all about, then, in a nutshell, is that uh, 
In response to the public health emergency that started several years ago, and combined with my personal knowledge of how especially high-dose edibles could really help people with the respect to offsetting the, the, the harms done by hard drug use, but also help people get through withdrawal, that uh, it became the thing to do to make sure that easy access to high-dose edibles was, uh, was available to people. So six years ago and a couple of weeks, uh, the idea that I had conceived about this, uh, I took to Van Du and uh, presented it to their board, the Vancouver Area Network of Drug Users, uh, a taxpayer-funded advocacy group uh, run by users, uh, for users, uh, to help with the oppression of the drug war. And they gave me unanimous approval to uh, go forward on their behalf or with them beside me uh, to, to City Council and get City Council to support the idea of making it as easy as possible to access high-dose edibles. Um, that being done without success, with City Council not wanting to talk about it at the time, uh, we continued on uh, gathering donations until uh, in early February, six years ago, I uh, had enough to start handing them out and we did that. Uh, that became the Cannabis Substitution Program pretty quickly. We did every Saturday for a year. Uh, hundreds of people lined up to get a, a care pack of four to six edibles and a couple of joints. Uh, for the, the following two and a half years, uh, still with people lining up on the streets by the hundreds, uh, we did twice a week, Thursdays and Sundays. Uh, studies were done on what we were doing and on other groups and how they were doing similar things. And the science became clear that uh, cannabinoids, especially in the form of high-dose edibles, could help people get through withdrawal and get off of those hard drugs. With the science, City Council got on board, passed a motion to support low barrier access, and in a meeting with us, agreed that we should find a storefront and that they would support us in that, and uh, especially if, uh, by their assessment, we were properly doing what the neighborhood required. We did that, we found a storefront, we set up a beautiful store, uh, we started uh, providing low cost as well as no cost uh, cannabis to people. Uh, for five and a half months, uh, we had a really good thing going on, but after five and a half months, we were evicted from the store because really, uh, when it came down to it, city council would not support us with a license to be there, not because we weren't meeting the needs of the neighborhood, but because we weren't meeting the needs of Health Canada. Uh, we, we needed to put an application into Health Canada and get their approval before the municipal government was willing to provide us that same business license. We put in an application to Health Canada in September, two years ago, and, uh, and we're told three months later, as I alluded to earlier, that uh, they were going to probably have our licenses by early that January, although it didn't happen and neither did it happen the following January and neither has it happened yet with another January coming right up almost two years now since that promised uh, license. And in that time, we've had uh, numerous uh, negotiations back and forth. I'm not sure I would call them negotiations. We've, we've sent Health Canada more of the science, uh, only to have them respond with that uh, we should be uh, waiting patiently because they're working hard on it. And uh, that's what we've been told. Uh, then uh, this past April, we received a letter from Health Canada stating that uh, their intent was to deny our application. Uh, they had two reasons for that. One, that our supply was not all legal, and two, that uh, the people that we were providing to, uh, they all needed to have doctors uh, supporting their choice. Uh, we responded to, uh, to that intent to deny with a, a long, uh, very good uh, argument about how uh, our supply could easily be made legal and we'd be more than happy to have legal supply if it was done properly and didn't increase our costs. Uh, and that it, uh, it's unreasonable to want to have everybody to have a doctor, that many people can't get a doctor, that that would eliminate a very large population of people in Canada that really need the help that uh, this particular uh, service is offering now. So that's our position and we stated it very eloquently, I thought, to Health Canada and we've now yet to hear back from them since we submitted that uh, before the deadline that they had given us. Uh, I believe it was uh, September of this year. So uh, since September, we've been waiting now for Health Canada to process uh, that rebuttal to their intent to deny. Uh, I've been told by insiders, uh, people in the industry, that the intent to deny is just a standard uh, uh, policy that they have, that it doesn't mean they're going to deny. 
Uh, it's actually a forebearer to actually getting your license. But here again, uh, you know, months have gone by and uh, we still have not had any, uh, any positive news from Health Canada. So upon being evicted from the, uh, the storefront for not having a license because the landlord uh, was threatened by the licensing department and uh, felt that he had no choice, um, we moved into an RV parked out front of that storefront because people had become uh, familiar with that as our location. And uh, we stayed in that RV for the last uh, two years plus, uh, two years and, and a little over a month now. Although that RV uh, recently uh, went up in flames as it was firebombed after a series of uh, break-ins um, into the RV. And uh, one of those break-ins uh, the night before the fire included someone, uh, after being confronted, uh, announcing that they were going to firebomb our RV, and that did happen. Uh, but uh, we've never uh, missed a day. We never missed a day at Van Du in all the three and a half years that we were there. Uh, we've never missed a day uh, here on the block since we uh, started the, our, our, our store here. So uh, once we didn't have the RV, we set back up under a tent. And every day from 11 to 7, uh, we operated uh, our little store out of a tent. Um, and uh, until I could get an RV and, uh, and, and actually I probably could have got an RV overnight. There was many generous people that were offering me uh, situations that I could have taken advantage of. But uh, a number of different factors were involved there. I, I waited uh, almost two weeks before we, uh, we did put the RV or another RV back in place there. Mostly because I wanted to get a sense of why that had happened. Uh, I thought that the neighborhood would, re would report to us. Uh, and uh, we would get a, a better, clearer picture of uh, what the risks were moving forward. But uh, that really didn't materialize, and uh, we weren't going to stop doing what we were doing anyway, because we really can't, in all good conscience, uh, stop helping the people that we've come to, uh, in many cases, consider even like family. The, the we've known them for, for four, five, six years. Uh, uh, we've watched them progress in their lives. We've We've uh, witnessed uh, their, their, their lives uh, as they tell us their stories as they come here. And so uh, we can't stop doing what we're doing uh, for those people. We know we're doing the right thing for them. And so uh, we continued uh, uh, until, uh, you know, and it got too cold under the tent. That was not sustainable. We really did need to get another RV. So uh, that's where we're at. And uh, now... Uh, you know, we were raided, that's what we've been talking about. We're going to be back in court on, on December 13th coming up here. Um, just another crazy twist in our journey to, uh, to finally uh, get low barrier access community cannabis stores was the VPD deciding that, uh, you know, after investigating and determining that we didn't have a license and we were providing cannabis for, for money, that, uh, that they should arrest us and charge us and see what the Crown would do about it. And so, yeah, all that happened, and uh, and so uh, let's go check out the RV and see uh, see what it's like out there at this point. Oh, by the way, before I do that, um, I need to mention that uh, you know we are not alone here in Vancouver. That the cannabis substitution program includes uh, other chapters uh, across Canada. Uh, in Halifax, uh, Chris Backer is there um, with the East Coast Cannabis Substitution Program. Uh, Chris is. Um, suffering with something going on in his leg. He's unable to even walk. I'm not sure how the program is going to continue without him or if it is, but I just saw that news this morning that he's been having quite a bit of pain in, in uh, one of his legs and that uh, it seems to be maybe an infection or something bad like that. Uh, so all our best to, to Chris. We hope that uh, that situation is resolved soon positively with you keeping your legs. and. Uh, um, yeah, man, our hearts are with you yeah. and our thoughts are with you. So uh, hopefully, uh, you know, things can go well for you. You you come first for sure, right? But you can't, if your health isn't good, you can't do what you're doing for other people. And so to be able to help them, you need to be good and 100%. So, uh, so I hope that works out. Um, we also have uh, William Hicks in London, Ontario, uh, operating a cannabis substitution program there. Uh, Mary, one of our head baker, our head baker here for a long time, uh, had to go to London, Ontario, and she took the project with her there, and it's been running ever since. So, uh, thanks to William for all his hard work and for what he's been doing there, and support those people if you can. Uh, it's really, really important. 
uh, that those uh, that those areas be able to do what they're doing. They also now have a number of people that have learned to rely on them, and it's important that that keeps going, and it only keeps going with donations. Uh, all of it is donations. Uh, Chris, William, Mary, myself, none of us are independently wealthy. None of us can do what needs to be done in making this program work without the help of people donating their, their baked goods and things. So, uh, you know, please uh, think if you can help do that uh, for those groups. And, uh, yeah, I just wanted to make sure we mentioned what's going on there at our other, in our other chapters. And let's have a brief uh, outside visit. Get the weather report. And the, the weekly weather report from the Human Way. <laughs> the weather report is, well, it's okay. cold. I got it. I got it. Yeah, it's cold. But it's not snowing. It's uh, it's actually toque weather for uh, toque weather. for those of us whose hair has thinned and and ears yeah. have grown. You know, the ears always keep growing. You know that. <laughs> uh oh, we're you're locked. Lo we're locked in. Uh oh. We're gonna, uh, oh. We're gonna solve that situation. There you go. A little up security sometimes. Oh, right Jesus. <laughs> All right. I see you have someone you're about to lock the door behind me, so I'll allow oh, that there to you happen. Go. Sure. Yeah. So. Here we are in uh, lovely downtown East uh, Vancouver. <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's clear, which is probably why it's as cold as it is. Uh, we had a little more sprinkling of snow. Uh, a week ago, uh, just after the last snow, um, we had a horrible situation here for sure. Uh, it seems to me that we were reporting on the snow that was coming down. Well, it kept coming down and came down uh, to the point where uh, the cars were not able to go, many of them. Uh, those that were couldn't get around those that couldn't in many cases and that uh, what should normally be about an hour-long drive from Vancouver to Surrey uh, took some in some cases up to 11 and 12 hours yep. for people to get home in many cases eight hours um, Yeah, a lot of people uh, stuck in their cars for long periods of time huge traffic jams uh, We hope that doesn't happen again. The municipalities were not ready for that uh, You know that doesn't normally happen around here for one right. thing but uh, that was just a little bit of a freak snowstorm that made it so that uh, the cars uh, didn't manage to get home from work that day like they should have, and uh, that happened. Uh, now it's a lot better, it's just cold. It's, yeah, it's just cold today. There's a little well. bit of snow in the forecast, but it's mixed with rain. There's no uh, forecast of any serious dumping going on. Uh, but that's just for the south coast of uh, It's only of the Vancouver. beginning of December. <laughs> yeah, well, we normally don't get too much anyway. Yeah. So here we are with the... Uh, replacement RV. We're very thrilled with this. Got uh, buddy Dex in the window there. He, he has it going. We don't have the side windows that work, uh, so we're doing things from the driver's door. I've got somebody looking into getting a, a replacement window that will allow us to see properly and, uh, and uh, move things back and forth properly, so that's coming. I like my signs, I always like the signs. Yeah, there we go. So we'll, uh, we'll let you ruminate on the sign for a minute. And now that sign's gonna move, so I'm gonna go over here. Oh, I didn't even knock, how about that? I know, I, yeah, I, I see you coming. <laughs> I see you coming. <laughs> so the, uh, the sign on the back is to cover up the plywood and the reinforcement yeah. that had to happen on the back door there. Wow, but, right? Uh, we got that on. It'd be, be harder to break in now than it was before, yeah. but I'm not leaving it here overnight anyway. No. Uh, so this is Adam. You all remember Adam from the previous shows. Hey. Uh, he's been helping us out here quite a bit. Uh, how's the CSP going? Wonderful. Yeah, we have people? Yeah, we definitely do. Oh, some of the stuff we got. You need a little piece of wood to put inside the door there to hold so it open. Hold, so it holds yeah. it up? Yeah. You do that. All right. Well, I've got some gummies here. I'll do that. All right, there you go. Oh, yeah, that's wow. better. And then we've got some uh, some coffee. Some gummies and some coffee. Yeah. Stuff from I Green think Wilderness. I can do, Neil, I think I can do that. We're out of the Gorilla Ganja. I'm going to have to reorder Look, some of that. Neil, right. Neil, I got a light. Oh, you got a light going? I got a light, yeah. Oh, right. oh, yeah, there you go. You just ask. And we got some cookies. Once again, I become redundant. <laughs> <laughs> Here, I'll try to hold the door, do the camera, and keep the light on. Hey, there I you got, go. I got, oh, yeah. All right, we got it. We got it. I got the door. Hey, what do you got there, Adam? Yeah. I'm still trying to turn my light on. Yeah, we got some sticky icky gummies. There you go. Mad Hatter stuff. And some 
Rice Krispie Squares. Uh, that's from Mary. Yep. Yeah. And they're so Everybody good. Thank joint. you, Mary. Yeah, everyone in these with a joint. So yeah. we got a bunch of things for people. Yeah. As always, uh, our we're out of caps. Yes. Uh, we got to, I got to go pay a visit to Dirty Dave. I'm hoping he come and visit us. I love when he comes and visits us. But, uh, you know, we, we always have something for people. We don't turn anybody away. We got John Murray uh, making muffins and cookies. Uh, Michael the Cookie Monster makes cookies for us as well. So there's always stuff here for people. There's a bunch of people that are part of the program. They come and get 420 milligrams every four days for free. And then there's other people that come and they don't have money and they're not part of the program. Well, they get one of John's muffins or a cookie and a joint or something like that. Uh, we do that dozens of times every day. Uh, there's a whole bunch of people that are relying on the program, even though they're not really part of the program, but they're kind of part of the program. <laughs> so uh, that's what goes on with that. So let's go on inside. All right. How do we go inside? Let's go let's inside. Go inside. Let's right. go inside. Let's go inside. Oh, no, George wants to go inside. We'll get out. We'll get out. There's room for you. Okay. Got bins and everything. Thanks. Here you go. Another light there as you go in. Oh, cool. Check out the light. <laughs> so it's a little different layout in here for sure. We, oh, yes. We're using the front uh, area to uh, to help people that come here for the healing wave. We do some processing back here. We put together our, our famous five bags. Uh, that's one of the things that has been, been so important. It's been well over a year now that we've had uh, cannabis for a dollar a gram. Yeah. Uh, what we've done is we've put together bags with five grams. It's all bud. It's not shake. It's not leaf. It's not bottom bag. It's not crappy weed. It's good weed. I believe the strain yeah. we have right now is Burmese. Uh, wow, Burmese. Yeah, nice. There's some Burmese there. Check that uh, out, people. Yeah, it's, it's been five very for good five, for a right? long time. Yeah. And that's that we call that our five for five bag, uh, five grams for five dollars. Uh, uh, everybody gets one per day per person. Uh, that's the limit. Uh, otherwise, people would buy large amounts and they'd just repackage it and resell it other areas. And we're not here to do that. We're here to try to help people get what they need. So. That's what you're doing. It's helping people, right? Yeah. So we we do have that. We have a lot of other things as well. Um, I, I kind of pride myself on having prices that are considerably lower than anybody else uh, by a long shot on, yeah. on many of the things that people need, like the the uh, the tears from heaven, as we call them, the the shatter, uh, the hash. Um, you know, vape come carts. and check us out. The vape carts. Now yeah. we just we just reduced our prices down to um, thirty five dollars for the the battery and the cart. Nice. So that's that's a heck of a deal. These are full gram uh, carts, and uh, and and also. Um, uh, it's it's really high quality material, right? Like we didn't we didn't lower the quality to lower the price. Um, Made with C9 so, distillate. Yeah. C9 distillate. Yeah. So yeah, that's yeah. kind of where we're and that's at. That's how you here. help people at the CSP, right? No, that's how we help people with the healing wave. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we do wave. have a Sorry. Uh, collaboration going on between the healing wave uh, uh, dispensary and the CSP. Okay. Uh, the CSP is all all by donation. Uh, the CSP does provide some low-cost cannabis and always has to raise money. Um, it has in the form of uh, setting up booths at the different uh, protests, uh, 420 Cannabis Day. Over the years, the CSP has always had a presence there. There's always been cannabis available at low cost to, to raise money for what we do with the CSP. Uh, it's an important uh, component. It's why we ended up in the collaboration with the Healing Wave, because when we were going to go full-time in a store, eight hours a day, six days a week. We extended that back in March to seven days a week. Uh, you know, there, there's rent to pay, and we're still paying rent on that store, by the way. That's the address that we're using for Health Canada. And uh, we're waiting for, never thought it was going to be over two years of yeah. paying rent on a, on, a, on a storefront that we can't use because Health Canada won't give us that piece of paper with a signature on it. But that's where we're at with that. And so uh, in needing to have money to pay rent and hydro and, and to remunerate the volunteers for, for being here because it's now an eight hour a day shift, six days a week. Uh, we did have to provide low cost cannabis to raise that money. But what happened out of that was that there was a, an understanding on our part of the people that were now accessing the low cost cannabis as opposed to the people that were accessing through the program 
is that there's a huge demographic of people that need to have low barrier discrete access and not a program that they have to register with and, and identify themselves as a drug user um, or anything like that or get a doctor to, to support what they're doing because they can't um, they can't admit to the doctors what's going on. They can't admit to their family what's going on. They need to have discrete low barrier access. That 100% needs to be available to a large population of people in Canada. And the government is um, criminally negligent in not allowing that if they continue to not allow that. Uh, it is definitely resulting in deaths by you know, members of this population of people that uh, need to have that kind of access. And without it, they're gonna die. So, or at least are at risk of death. So that's kind of uh, what's going on here in a nutshell. Uh, we're in court on uh, next Tuesday. We'll have a report for you what happens at that time. In the meantime, uh, boy oh boy, this next week would be a great time to write a letter or send an email to the Federal Crown, uh, to uh, you know some of the local politicians here, to, uh, to do whatever you can to have your voice heard uh, to support us uh, as we go before a judge and have that evil entity, Health Canada, uh, being uh, uh, represented by that even more evil entity, the Federal Crown Prosecution's <laughs> Office, uh, come after us for uh, daring to uh, try to get the prices down where people can afford it to, and, and use it for their, uh, their health and well-being. Um, that's, it's, a, it's a situation worth worth viewing. We hope that you'll come and help us with yeah, that. We hope that if you can't, you can write a letter, make a phone call, send an email to the Federal Crown. You can find them. You can Google them. Uh, if not the Federal Crown, local media, local politicians, all of those people. If enough people contact those people, they'll do something about it. They'll make a phone call themselves. They'll get involved. So please help us with that. Uh, be part of the solution here. It's a way to give back. It's a way to not feel frustrated and helpless in a world where there's a lot of bad things going on. This is a way that you can help and, and we can really make, make a difference and change the world for the better uh, by allowing low barrier access to cannabis, as I have uh, said so many times. I'm, I'm repeating that phrase over and over and over again. I'm probably dreaming it in my sleep. I've heard it a few times. Low barrier access, what, what could, you know, it means low prices. It means uh, low scrutiny. It means uh, the huge variety of different potencies that you might need and want. It means all of those things, that there need be no barriers. And the courts Absolutely. recently said that again uh, in, the, in the Warnicky, Seaman and Martin case, that uh, Canadians deserve to have the ability to, uh, to access these things through a storefront and they need to have no limits put on the potency of these things because those limits are arbitrary and unjustified. So uh, yeah, help us, help people, help yourself, live a better life, enjoy your life a little better, get the energy of being part of the solution. Let's get back and have some uh, some real old-fashioned uh, protests and demonstrations yeah. and, uh, and and have our voices heard. As Wen said earlier in the show that uh, you know a bunch of people demanding change to legislation brought forward by the, the NDP party uh, demonstrated outside of David Eby's office and he's now uh, changed his mind on that. Yeah. So, so let's, we can do that too. Let's try, at least try, right? Let's see if there's more protests going on. Yeah. Well, over the past year, it seems yeah. like, you know, I think next year you're going to see a lot more. I hope so. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of things to protest. We, we yeah. need to have our we voices heard. We're smart people. We deserve to have our rights respected. Shit, we used to have parades down, down the road, man. We're a giant amount of people. A giant amount. We're not. We are legion. Yeah. yeah for sure we are. So thanks. There you go. Uh, thanks to all the people that helped out uh, already to this point in so many ways. Thanks to Cannabis Culture and Pot TV for giving me the platform. Thanks to uh, 8 out of 10 Glenn for uh, for being my producer on the show. Uh, and, and we'll see how far that goes. It might, it might be a career that he's uh, I told him he was not uh, watching on down here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, no, no, I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to stick there. with you. I, I'm, I'm not going anywhere. Right. Very good. <laughs> Thank and, you. Uh, and go about making the world a better place and, and, and help yourself be a better human. Every day is just practice. You're just uh, trying to figure out what to do better the next day. Uh, and, and the most important part of all of it is don't get hung up on the negative stuff. Don't get brought down by people who are trying to bring you down. Go about your life just changing the world, having as much fun as you can. I'll see you next week.